Well, we're in Zephaniah, as I said, so take your Bibles, turn to Zephaniah. And interestingly with Zephaniah here, as we've been traveling through the minor prophets and taking this overview look of these uh, interesting great books and just going through the whole Bible in this journeying um, from 30,000 feet, soaring through scriptures here. With Zephaniah, there's more known of him than there is of all the other minor prophets. A lot of the minor prophets, as they're writing, there's, they're kind of writing out of obscurity. We don't know a whole lot about them, their, their heritage, even the, the time exactly that they're writing. But with Zephaniah, he makes that very clear to us. He identifies these details better than all the other minor prophets. We know from the very first verse that he was the great, great grandson of Hezekiah and most likely King Hezekiah there uh, of Judah. So this would make Zephaniah of this royal line, which is very interesting. And he identifies the time of the writing as he mentions uh, Josiah, who was the king of Judah. Josiah was the king of Judah from 640 BC to 609 BC. So Zephaniah is writing within this time period. So it's before the Babylonians have come uh, against Jerusalem, but it's at the time when the Babylonian Empire is kind of great, gaining in strength and in power and in might. And so Zephaniah is speaking in this time right here. Now, what's interesting is as we got Hezekiah mentioned and we got Josiah mentioned. In between these two kings, King Hezekiah and King Josiah, Josiah, there were two really bad kings of Judah. All right, you got Manasseh and you've got Ammon, two really ruthless, wicked bad kings of Judah that ushered in a time uh, of, of real, you know, compromise, corruption, idolatry, all these kinds of things. Judah had really begun to spin out of control. So Josiah now, he comes on the scene as king when he's only eight years old. And it's during this time that, that Zephaniah began to speak out against all the idolatry that was taking place there in Judah. So Zephaniah is ministering as young King Josiah is, is, is coming on the throne and, and seeking to usher the, the kingdom into a time of, of revival. It's during that time, during Josiah's reign, that remember the, the book of the law was discovered or rediscovered there in the temple. And it just ushered in these great reforms that began to take place as, as Josiah and others began to say, we need to align ourselves with the word of God here. We've gotten so far away from the word, I mean, they just misplaced it. They put it away. And so now they're suddenly beginning to see these things. And no doubt Zephaniah was a real help, a real voice, a real trigger to the spiritual awakening that was taking place there in Josiah's reign. So that's kind of the time period here with Zephaniah. Now, nevertheless, Zephaniah is ministering at a crucial time. Because though there was a great revival under King Josiah, the revival didn't quite penetrate deep down into the hearts of the people. There was a great external change that took place in a number of ways, but there wasn't a deep internal effect or change that took place in the heart uh, of the people there. So here's what's happening now is that God's ready to bring judgment down upon this nation once again here. And he's going to do so through the wicked Babylonians as we've seen in other prophetic writings here. So Judah would be taken away as captives to Babylon. And so Zephaniah is sounding the alarm. Just as God is always faithful to make sure that he's warning his people of what is coming. And so Zephaniah is that voice right now sounding the alarm for people to repent and get back on track with God because of what God is raising up and what God is about to do. So Zephaniah, interestingly, he's a contemporary of Jeremiah, of Nahum and of Habakkuk, who we looked at last week here. And he's one of the last prophets to minister before the great fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. The last three books of the Minor Prophets that we'll be getting into, um, well, one tonight and then two more next week here to close the Old Testament. The last three books of the Minor Prophets are going to be these post-exilic writings, meaning that they're being written after the captives have come back from Babylon and are entering back into the land again and dealing with kind of the stuff that is going on. So we'll look at that here tonight in the book of Haggai, interestingly, very good. But here's a bit of a timeline, and I, I hope you can kind of read some of that. Um, but just a timeline of the prophets that were ministering, the kingdoms that they were primarily ministering to, and, and, and somewhat of, 
a, a bit of a time period here to give you an idea as to what's happening here with the prophets. So hopefully you can see that. Hopefully that's a bit of a, a help to get a bird's eye view as to, you know, when Zephaniah, for instance, is ministering, Habakkuk's ministering right around that same time, just before the fall of Jerusalem. And then we'll see Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi ministering after uh, the return from captivity. So the theme of the book of Zephaniah, anybody know the theme of the book of Zephaniah? I mean, not that I'm expecting anybody to give the answer for that, but the theme of the book of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, as is often the case in the prophets, Zephaniah had an immediate view of what this day of the Lord was going to be, what it's going to look like, but he also had a, a far view, uh, a future view of what this day of the Lord is. As so often times in, in prophecy, there's a, a double fulfillment in a sense, a near fulfillment and then a far fulfillment. And so Zephaniah's understanding that the day of the Lord is at hand, and it's going to be through the Babylonians coming against Jerusalem, bringing the judgment of God. But we're also going to be looking ahead to a future day of the Lord. So here's a bit of the outline that we're going to look at here in Zephaniah. We're going to see the day of the Lord and the Jews. We're going to see the day of the Lord and the Gentiles. And then we're going to see the day of the Lord and the kingdom, specifically the future kingdom that God is going to be establishing through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Zephaniah is, is full of God's judgment that is ready to hit. J. Vernon McGee put it this way. The book of Zephaniah is like a Florida hurricane, a Texas tornado, a Mississippi river flood, a Minnesota snowstorm, and a California earthquake all rolled into one. It, it says, though, Zephaniah is taking what all the other eight previous minor prophets have said, and he's just compacting it all together into one writing. It caused George Adam Smith to say, no hotter book lies in the Old Testament. Martin Bucer, back in 1528, said, if anyone wishes all the secret oracles of the prophets to be given in a brief compendium, let him read through this brief Zephaniah. So it's an interesting book. Now, yet in the midst of the greatness of judgment that's going to be communicated in Zephaniah, as we're going to see, pretty strong language that's going to be spoken of here in this book. The book ends, as often the prophets do, as often God wants to assure, it ends with a message of restoration and deliverance for God's people. We see that often through the prophets, because though God is a God of judgment, he is, another, side, uh, another characteristic of God is that he's compassionate, he's merciful, he's loving. Now, too often we look at these as, as kind of uh, opposing views. They're, they're in conflict. How can you have a God of judgment, yet have a God that's loving, that's compassionate, that's merciful? How do these two kind of relate? How do they, how do they coexist, or, or how do you reconcile these two? And so too often times, people are looking at these as being that they, it, it, it can't be. But even in God's judgment, God is acting in love. Whether it's to bring people to a place of repentance that he might heal them and forgive them and, and restore them. Or perhaps it's to act in judgment to bring an end to further harm from taking place, you see. God's always acting in love and, and kindness and, and in justice. Though he's compassionate and mercy, his character is also to be just. And though he's just, his character is also to be compassionate and, and merciful. We see this here with God. And we see that here in the book of, of Zephaniah. The great thing is, is that God has spared us from his wrath and judgment if we have placed our lives in him. In fact, the very name Zephaniah, it means Yahweh hides or hidden in Yahweh. Isn't that good? And we'll see that even written here in the book of Zephaniah. We'll get to that in a little bit here. But it's a great reminder for us here because God desires to wrap you up to shield and secure you that's the life that we can have in christ that can be hidden with him it says in colossians two, uh, 3 verse 23 if then you were raised with christ seek those things which are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on things on the earth for you died and your life is hidden with christ in god it's not a great reminder for us to think that oh man I, i've died to my old self and i've died to the history that has so oftentimes been a, a burden on me. I've died to those things, and I'm, I have new life in Christ. I'm hidden with Christ. In other words, I don't have to fear his judgment. 
or his wrath has already been taken care of. I'm hidden with Christ. Praise the Lord for that. Well, let's get into this here. Chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read a few verses here just to give us a bit of a, a running start. It says this, The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amari, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests. Verse 5. Those who worship the host of of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So you notice that Zephaniah isn't beating around the bush here. He's laying it on pretty heavy, pretty hard, pretty thick. He's basically saying, listen, the Lord is going to consume everything. All right? Typically, you might want to start with a bit of encouragement when you got a word that's pretty heavy for people, not with Zephaniah. He's like, listen. God's going to consume everything. I mean, he's not speaking on his own behalf. This is the word of the Lord here to the people. God is showing that his judgment is going to be severe, and it's going to be widespreading. It's going to cover all things here. And we get a glimpse of why this judgment is coming. God's making it very clear to them. What, he's not leaving people in the dark. Nobody's having to sit there and go, well, why, God? This isn't fair. Why are you allowing this to happen? God spells it out for them here because there's been much idolatry taking place. You've been worshiping the Baals. You've been worshiping the host of heaven on the housetops. You've even sworn by Milcom, who is the Ammonite God. You see, the people have been tracking with all these other different religions. Now, they've also been, you know, looking to swear oaths by the Lord, it says. But then it says, but also... Sworn by Milcom. See, what was happening was there was this syncretism going on. There was a, a meshing of all these different kind of religions and practices. It was as though the people were trying to cover their bases. Let's make sure we just kind of worship everything and that should keep us safe. But what does God say? You shall have no other gods before me. Plain and simple. God is the only God and the only true God. And so he's the only God that needs to be worshiped. But the people of Israel were not doing so. This is why the Lord calls out those who have turned back from following the Lord. See, they may have thought they were following him. But if they were adding things, then they were not truly following the Lord. If we're not following the Lord wholeheartedly, if we're looking to kind of add things, put our hope in a few different places other than the Lord, then we're not truly worshiping the Lord. And we've, we've turned We've turned back from following the Lord. So the Lord desires your whole heart. The Lord desires faithfulness and, and, and for us to worship him in, in spirit and truth and to worship only him. You can't have it both ways. And the people of Israel were trying to have it their way. They were doing a little smorgasbord of religion here. We're going to take a little bit of that. We're going to take a little bit of that. We're going to mix it with this and have that as well. But you can't have it that way. It's the Lord or it's nothing. So God says in verse 7, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He's invited his guests. And it shall be in the day the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. Here we see now the mention of the day of the Lord. It's something that is referenced or alluded to some 23 times just in these three chapters of Zephaniah. So it's a huge emphasis here. And as it's used by the prophets, the day of the Lord is that time when for God's glory and according to his purposes, God intervenes in human affairs, in, in judgment against sin, or it's for the deliverance of his own. The day of the Lord is going to bring judgment against the enemies of God, but blessing to those who are his. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 to 4, says that uh, we don't have to be concerned or worried about this. It says, therefore, you yourselves 
know perfectly that the day the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. God, again, desires to hide you in him and for you to find safety in him. But here's what the people are exhorted to do in light of this soon coming day of the Lord. It's right there in verse 7. Be silent. Be silent in the presence of the Lord. See, when God begins to move, nobody's going to be able to counter it or give an excuse and say, Hold on, Lord. This isn't right. Look at what I've been doing. I shouldn't have to be, you know, succumbing to this kind of treatment. No, God's going to say, Be silent. It's amazing how many people today try to excuse their sin or, or think that it's not their fault. They're not the ones to blame. But in the day of judgment, nobody can say, that's not my fault. Or, Lord, I never knew. Or, God, why? Day of judgment, nobody's going to have anything to say other than just being silent. Because we'll see God in his perfect justice. God always does everything fair and right. This day the Lord would be experienced in Zephaniah's day as they'd be judged by God through their captivity by the Babylonians. This is what Zephaniah is immediately looking towards and seeing coming down the pike here. Babylonians are coming. God form a judgment. Now, Zephaniah pictures this scene as God preparing a sacrifice a little feast. He's invited his guests. So the sacrifice is, is going to be Israel and, and Judah. The guests are going to be the Babylonians that are going to take part in seeing all this unfolding here. So it's kind of like this little feast that God is preparing here. And in verse 10, And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down all those who handle money are cut off. So Zephaniah describes this loud wail right now from all the various regions of Jerusalem. You got the fish gate, which is interesting because that's the northern gate. That was the place that Nebuchadnezzar entered through in his raid of the city. So the very place that the Babylonians would enter in through first, the fish gate. And then there's mentioned the second quarter. Uh, that was in the northwest of the temple area. And then Maktesh was the market or business district. It was where many got rich through, through dishonesty and, and, and corruption there. So it's in riches that many place their trust today for security, isn't it? Where a lot of people are working to try to find some kind of security or, or safety is through their riches. This place is singled out as it shows that those that are relying on those things are not going to be spared. They're going to be cut off as well. Now, verse 12 lays out the attitude of so many in this time. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Hmm. See, what was happening here was everyone was just kind of resting in their own comfort or complacency. They're sitting back thinking, oh, we're safe. God's not going to do anything wrong. He may, not, he may not do anything at all. He's just probably going to be very impartial towards us and not even do anything. They were thinking that they were, they were safe. They felt comfortable. They became complacent. It's kind of like what, what Jesus speaks out against in Revelation 3, 15, and 16 about those believers that are lukewarm, right? You're neither hot nor cold. Well, you're lukewarm. I'm I'm going to what? I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out, right? The Lord's not looking for complacent, lukewarm believers. He wants people that are on far from, that are doing something, that are not sitting back in complacency, but are being active and just living for him, enjoying life in him, serving him faithfully. So in the midst of impending judgment and great difficulty through this day the Lord, notice what happens here as we move into chapter 2. God still giving opportunity for people to turn to him and repent. This is always the heart of God. God is long-suffering. And though we read passages of, of judgment coming where you think, oh my, God's so harsh. 
And so oftentimes the view people have of God, he's just so harsh. And he's just all about wrath and judgment. But yet, God's long-suffering. And he gives people chance after chance to make things right. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like, a ch like chaff. Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be, notice this, the name is Zephaniah, it may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. That's the desire of the Lord right there. Seek me. Seek me and you will live. That's what the word often says. Seek me and you will find forgiveness you will find reconciliation you'll find yourself being able to be hidden in me and spared seek me in repentance this is what god is calling out for them to do nobody is too far gone the lord will not turn away from a repentant heart but it takes action on our part doesn't it it takes us admitting our sin that's where a lot of people have a hard time with that it's like well i'm not such a bad person I'm not, I don't think I'm a sinner. I don't need to repent, do I? That's for, that's for those people that are like in prison or have broken the law. I, I don't need to repent, do I? That's what God's calling us to do, to walk in repentance, show fruit worthy of repentance that, that recognizes, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost without you. It's only in you that I'm, I, I, I find life and forgiveness of sin. He's calling us all to do that. And when we do, guess what? We find that hideaway in Jesus. We find safety and security. We find ourselves covered in the righteousness of Christ and not our own. Where God no longer sees us, but he sees Jesus in us. I'm so thankful for that. And this always seems to be the pattern, you know, of God. Sparing those that are truly his so they don't, have to go through that full impact of his wrath. We've seen that with Noah, Lot, Enoch, the children of Israel in Egypt. I mean, the rapture of the church is just a great example again of God looking to spare those and to hide them away in him so that they don't have to go through the brunt of his wrath because as, as 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, 5, 9 says, for God did not appoint us under wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not appointed under wrath. The judgment of God has already been, been meted out at the cross. And it's through our faith in Jesus that we are spared and hidden in Christ. Now, from Zephaniah, chapter 2, verse 4, to the end of chapter 2, verse 15 there, we look at the nations around Israel. Some of these nations were God's instruments uh, of judgment against his people, uh, Assyria and Babylon specifically. But you see, what happened is they went against the, the call of God. God wanted them to come in and, and kind of, you know, wake up his people and instill that fear of God once again. But what happened is these nations came in and they looked to humiliate, obliterate God's people. And they, they did so in great, you know, malice and, and heaviness. So God shows his displeasure at how those nations had treated his people, how they went above and beyond what really God was calling them to do. And so God now is showing that he's going to be judging them as well. So the Lord calls out five nations, all of which are surrounding Israel. We see the Philistines to the west, verses 4 to 7 in chapter 2. We see Moab and Ammon to the east, Ethiopia to the south, and then Assyria up to the north there. Look at verse 15 in chapter 2. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely. That said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. Man, this is a surefire recipe to experience God's judgment on you. To sit there and think with this attitude, I am it, right? It's all about me. It's not great. I mean, it's not kind of what happened in Nebuchadnezzar. Look at all that I have done. And boop. All right. Let's put you in your place, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that's what Assyria is doing. I am it, they said. 
and there is none besides me. It's never a wise thing to think that you're it because only God is it. It's only in God that we can do anything. We never put the, the onus on us or even the, the glory upon ourselves to think that we accomplished anything. It's all through the Lord. Only he is all powerful, sovereign, mighty, and strong. We need to be saying more often, I am nothing, but in Jesus I have everything. Now from Zephaniah 3, verses 1 to 7, God lets Jerusalem now know that they haven't been any better than these surrounding nations. In fact, they should have recognized that God means business by how he's dealt with all these nations around them. They should have seen the, the hand of the Lord against them and, and kind of recognized, oh man, we better get our act together here. Because we're not living any better than all these other guys are. But Jerusalem just continued on in corruption. Look at chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. God says to Jerusalem, I, I've cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I've made their streets desolate. With none passing by, their cities are destroyed. There's no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling will not be cut off. But despite everything for which I punished her, but they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. Basically saying, I would have thought you guys would have gotten the message. But you just continued on in corruption. You rose early and corrupted all your deeds. Despite everything for which I punished her, you just continued on your way. So God speaks his word against Jerusalem. But then we move into verse 8. And here we see things begin to change a little bit here. Now we get the intended outcome God had through all this. As we look ahead to the future day of the Lord. Look at verse 8. God says, therefore wait for me, says the Lord. Until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms. To pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured within with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. That they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. We'll stop right there. So first of all, we see we're called to wait for him. He's going to judge, but then he will restore. So it's kind of like, you know, trust him. Wait for him. Just trust the process, what God's doing here. That God's sovereign, that God is good, and that God is working all things out for the good. So trust him in this. And he says here that I'm going to restore to the people a pure language. That they all may call on the name of the Lord. How awesome. See, remember at the Tower of Babel, at this greatest show of, of rebellion against God. What did God do? He confused the languages. Everybody scattered. But there's coming a day when he's going to bring everyone together under one pure language. Now that happened in part of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit poured out. People began to speak and others began to understand. There began to be unity through the Holy Spirit once more. But it's going to come in a fuller way when... When many believe there will be a restoration of one language, most likely the English language, with everybody saying A at the end of every sentence. I think that might be what we'll be dealing with in the kingdom there. No, some scholars believe that this is a promise to restore the ancient Hebrew language, make it the global language of all mankind at this time when God restores the kingdom to Christ. Now, the restoration of the Hebrew language in Israel today is nothing less than a modern miracle. Um, prior to the century, or to this century, Hebrew had not been spoken since the 6th century B.C. when the Jews were carried off to Babylon. When they returned, the Jews spoke the Aramaic they picked up in Babylon. Only the religious leaders knew Hebrew, and soon it became a dead language. Hebrew wasn't spoken again until the 20th century. When Jews from all over the globe returned to their homeland, they came speaking a zillion languages. Communication was difficult. But a Jerusalem journalist named Eliezer Ben Yehuda recognized the problem and made it a personal campaign to revive Hebrew. He started with a vocabulary of just 7,700 words, all taken from the Bible. Well, today, modern Hebrew contains 100,000 words. 
Hebrew is the only dead language in history that has been uh, restored to common everyday usage. That's pretty amazing. And so many believe that that Hebrew language is going to be the one common language spoken during the millennium. This kingdom of Christ, this reign of Christ here on earth. Wouldn't that be cool? I've always wanted to speak another language. I'm just stuck with English. Can I get past English? But I think one day I'm going to speak in Hebrew along with you guys. Wouldn't that be awesome? Who knows? But it's pretty cool to think about. Well, verse 14, we'll wrap up Zephaniah here. It says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now, as much as this is for those in that day that Zephaniah was speaking, and how they're going to experience the deliverance of the Lord from their enemies and be brought in the kingdom, it's as much for us presently today who have put our trust in Jesus Christ. Are we living glad lives today? That's the message there. Rejoice. God's going to take care of you. He's going to remove all the judgments from you. He's going to do this. But we've already experienced that in and through Christ. Are we living lives like this now that are are rejoicing and being glad over what Jesus has done? The King of Israel? What he's accomplished for us? Are we rejoicing? But notice, it says also that He's going to quiet you with his love. Maybe you're still questioning the legitimacy of this for yourself. He says, I'm going to quiet you with my love. Have you been quieted with his love lately? You see, too often we're, we're just frantic and worried about what's going on around us. Our, our, our minds are going a mile a minute. We're thinking about all the things that have to get done. And sometimes we just fail to stop and just allow the the great love of Jesus just to settle into our hearts and to be quieted by his love to know that he cares for you he loves you he's with you he's seeing you through each and everything that you're going through be quieted by his love and he loves to spend time with you even rejoicing over you as singing remember as a child right when you had restless nights and you couldn't see, maybe it was a bad dream. Well, maybe you had your mom come in and just sing you a song. Remember how comforting that was? Just lie in bed, right? Sometimes I'm tempted just to call my mom up one night and just, you know, sing me a song. Michelle won't do it for me, but I try. But that's the image of God here. He's singing over us. He's singing over us, just, again, reminding us of his love here. What a great picture that is for us. God delights in you, and he's provided for you through his son, Jesus Christ. Be renewed and, and, and restored in him and through him today. Well, let's move on to Haggai. Haggai, just a couple chapters. And as we come to Haggai, we come to a very interesting time shift now. Because Zephaniah's writing. Just a few years before the Babylonians are going to come in. Well, the people have been led away into, into exile in Babylon. The judgment of God was carried out. People never fully repented. But now Haggai comes on the scene. And this is now after this Babylonian captivity. As, as those that were in exile are returning back to the land. As they were given a green light to return back to the land here now. And what's interesting is that it was in, in, in 538 B.C. Under Cyrus, king of Persia, Jews were allowed to leave Babylon, go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. It was being led by Zerubbabel. But sadly, after 70 years in captivity, only 50,000 people returned back when they were given the green light to go. Only 50,000 people returned out of perhaps, I don't know, upwards of a couple million people that were taken away into captivity. Only 50,000 people decided to return back. See, many people got very comfortable there in Babylon. They want to make the trek back. But all those 50,000 in return, 
they came back to Jerusalem. And, and two years later, in 536 BC, construction on the temple began. The altar was rebuilt. Sacrifices were reinstituted. And the foundation of the second temple was laid. But, but then the work stopped. See, opposition had set in. They got an injunction from the Persians to shut down construction. And so for the next 15 years now, all work at the temple had stopped completely. Job wasn't done. But the people were done. They stopped altogether. The temple lay at a standstill. It was a period of great apathy and complacency. But then along came a change in the Persian government. Again, another open door was given to complete the work uh, at the construction site of the temple. But what happened is that the people were a little bit too preoccupied with their own stuff, with their own buildings, with their own life, and things remained at a standstill. So God raised up two men to kind of light this fire under the Jews now to get busy on what really mattered. The first one is Haggai. The second one is Zechariah, as we'll get into next week here. But Haggai's ministry was uh, quite a short one, covered only four months. Most prophets ministered over a period of of years, whereas Haggai just ministered for a few months and really, again, just needed to rally the troops here, get that fire lit, get people focused on what was really important. And Haggai is the, the second shortest book in the Old Testament next to Obadiah. But it's a book packed with straight to the heart stuff. Frankie Gabelin wrote, the truth is that few prophets have succeeded in packing into such brief compass so much spiritual common sense as Haggai did. And we'll see that as we go through it. But you see, here's the thing is God wants to bless his people. All right? I think, I'm sure we can all agree with that. God desires to bless his people. I hope you realize that. I hope you know that tonight. God loves to bless his people. But that blessing is linked to their relationship with him, to their obedience with him. To the Jews in this day, it was linked to that covenantal relationship with them. And so if the temple was lying in ruins, well, they were not able to carry out the things that they were called to do in that covenantal relationship with God. The temple was very important. So God stirs up the people to get back to what is needed, and that is, for them, the rebuilding of the temple. Now, the very name Haggai means festival. Some believe it's because he was born during one of the Jewish feasts, but perhaps his name was symbolic for really just the joy that people could truly be walking in if that temple was intact. And the worship of God was being carried out in the right way. They'd be experiencing the joy like they do in their festivals of just coming before the Lord. And it's true for us. Sometimes we're walking in a very lethargic state because we're not taking the time just to come and meet with the Lord. To be with the Lord. To worship the Lord. Because there's great joy that's renewed as we just come and, and worship God. So... Haggai presents four short messages now to the people over these four months period. Just these four messages that cut right to the heart of the matter in what's going on. Getting the people back on track. The first message is about misplaced priorities. Second message was about mistaken power. Third message, murky purity. And the fourth message was directed to a man of prophecy that we'll see here at the end of the book. But Haggai's first message, misplaced priorities, look at chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, and, and let me stop right there. So Haggai does something very unique for us here, because he gives very precise dates when he gives his messages. Again, like I said, with some of the other prophets were... We're kind of vague on the dates. We've got a, a general timeline, but not exact. But Haggai gets very specific on when this is happening. So we know the dates he's given us here. It's, it's August 29th, 520 B.C. And again, here's kind of the timeline of events that we're seeing here, um, kind of centered around Haggai's ministry here. 586 B.C., just a refresher, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. 539, Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon. 538, the return of the Jews to Judea begins. Again, that first kind of um, returning group there. There were three groups that returned, basically. And then in 536, the rebuilding of the temple begins, but then stops. 520, 
B.C. Haggai preaches the temple rebuilding resumes, and then in 515, the temple is completed. So that's kind of the, the timeline here centered around Haggai. But then we see the word of the Lord was given to Haggai for Zerubbabel and Joshua, although for all of Israel as well, no doubt. But at this time, Zerubbabel was the governor of Jerusalem and the governor of the first group of returning exiles from Babylon. He's the grandson of Jehoiakim, who was the last legitimate king of Judah. And we'll talk about the significance of that at the end of the book when we deal with that man of prophecy, all right? But then also, this is a, a, a word really directed to Joshua. These are the two key figures here. Joshua is the high priest. Two key figures here now that were used to stir up the people here. So it says in verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So we're dealing with these misplaced priorities. Now, the people in Haggai's day, as mentioned earlier, they started out well. Right? They got the, the brazen altar erected. Sacrifices were being made again. The foundation of the temple was laid. Things were off to a good start, and it was a joyous time in Jerusalem. People were like, yeah! All right, the temple is coming to form and fruition again. Woo! They're excited. But then opposition came, followed by discouragement, then distraction. And then the building of the temple sat idle for 15 years. So Haggai has to come now, and speak into this apathetic attitude that had set in with the people. Notice the Lord says, this people says. That's a little bit unusual for the Lord to speak that way. Because usually he referred to this people as my people. But now he's saying this people, right? It's showing his disapproval with the way that they were acting. Well, how were they acting? Like procrastinators. They believed in the saying, let's put off till tomorrow what we can be doing today. Let's put off till tomorrow what we could do today. Let's just sit back and do nothing today. It reminds me of the pastor's son. He was just eight years old, but having been raised in the church, he'd heard all the biblical terms before justification, sanctification, revelation, all these Asians. He'd heard them countless times, but he didn't know what they all meant. All he knew was that these were... Some pretty big church words. Well, one day in his school, his teacher asked him if he knew the meaning of the word procrastination. He thought a while about it, then answered, no, I'm not sure what that means, but I know our church believes in it. Sadly, a lot of churches do believe in that. They love to hold back, procrastinate. It's kind of their modus operandi, and it characterizes what they do. Not willing to step out and do a work for the Lord. Are there times... We can make procrastination sound very spiritual. Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of times we can sit back and go, well, I'm just kind of waiting on the Lord here. I'm just, just letting the Lord kind of direct and just waiting on what he has for me next here. And, and we can make procrastination sound pretty spiritual, right? That's what these guys were doing. They said, the time has not yet come. It's not of the Lord right now for us to build the church. Yeah, it was. He'd gotten the green light already from, from Persia. God's already said to you 15 years ago, build the temple. Like, what are you waiting for? But they're trying to make it sound like, well, the time has not yet come. We're just waiting on the Lord here. They weren't taking any steps of faith in action. But you know, it's much easier to steer a car that is moving, right? Right? So often, we just want to kind of put it in park. And we put it in park. The Lord's not able to direct us and move us. It's as we're on the go that God is oftentimes able to move us and keep us going in the direction he asked for us. It's a lot easier to steer a car that's moving. Now, here's the other reason they were not getting anything done. They were too busy worrying about their own stuff, right? Misplaced priorities. It wasn't wrong that they were preparing houses, but these were paneled houses, it says, right? Do you, do, you, do you see that there? They were fixing for themselves these paneled houses in verse 4 while the temple was lying in ruins. Normally, houses in that day were made of stone. But if you want to spruce things up, make it a little bit more elegant, a little upgrade, you'd install some panels on the thing, right? 
show a little bit of your, your prestige here. The equivalent today would be the sunroom add-on, the refurbished patio and barbecue area, the extension off the kitchen. Now there's anything wrong with those things. I was feeling a lot of guilt as I was going through this, thinking, Lord, am I spending too much time on a house? And not in the... But no, the idea is that it's panel houses. You're, you're going above and beyond what you really need to do. And again, not that any of those things are, are wrong, but for the people in this day, that became their sole focus. That became everything that they were worried about, thinking about, and doing. Their priority was not where it should have been. Their own house remodels took precedence over the completion of the temple. Reading on in verse 5, God says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Hmm. That's a great picture there, isn't it? Consider your ways in the Hebrew it is to set your heart upon something, to think about it seriously. Really, like, evaluate what's going on here. These people needed to reevaluate what they were doing and how profitable it really was. Because they were doing lots. They were working hard, but there was little to show for it. All the, all the shortcomings they're experiencing was a direct result of their coming up short with the Lord. They were not doing the things that the, the Lord had simply asked of them to do. Can you ever relate to what these guys are going through? Ever feel like you're just going and going and going, working and striving, and ever feel like you're, you're getting anywhere? Or, or, or making enough? No matter how much you, you try or, or put energy into it, oftentimes it comes back to your walk with the Lord. How is that? Have we gotten away from him? Have we had misplaced priorities in our lives? Because the Bible is clear. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added to you. The Bible is clear on that. We need to put the Lord first in what we're doing. If, if we think we can get ahead with the Lord kind of behind us, then all we're doing, like what Haggai says here, what the Lord says, it's like you're just putting money into pockets that have holes in the bottom. And you got nothing to show for it. You go, Where, where's everything going? Setting those priorities straight. The Lord says in verse 8, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. So God directs the people to turn their focus away from their own pleasures and focus on the Lord. They, they were taking pleasure in their own homes, in their own things. Now, it was time for the Lord to take pleasure in his. That's something that should be a concern for us today. Is our places of worship something that the Lord can take pleasure in? Are we giving him, you know, kind of our leftovers, our hand-me-downs? Is our priority to find pleasure in our own things or to have God take pleasure in what we're doing for him and giving to him? And then so doing seeing him be glorified in and through it see if we're living for self we're, we're just never going to be satisfied that's kind of what is being said here it it, it comes to nothing it comes to little verse 9 you, you looked for much but indeed it came to little you're hoping to really gain from this but it profited nothing it it, it satisfied didn't satisfy at all because the Lord wasn't in it. They weren't involving the Lord in it. Dyer said this, those who plan to give to God once they have enough for themselves will never have enough for themselves. How we need to make the Lord the priority in our life. Putting him first in every way. In our worship in our activity, in our giving, making him the priority. Well, Haggai's second message is about mistaken power. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. 
In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. So the work was getting done or being done to some degree, but now Haggai speaks to encourage the people. You see, as the work started, the task looked too great. Haggai asks, who saw the temple in its former days, in its former glory? Because truly, Solomon's temple was something to behold, magnificent, glorious. It was majestic. But now as they come into Jerusalem, after returning from exile, they see a pile of rubble. And now they're having to try to restore this building out of this pile of rubble. And as they're putting stones together, they're looking at this going, I ain't seen Solomon's temple coming out of this. And it tells us in Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, that as the foundation was laid, there was a mixed reaction. All the younger people were sitting here celebrating over the fact there, there's great shouts of joy going up because, yeah, our temple is being formed again. Our temple is coming into place once more. But all those that were there that had seen the former temple, it tells us in Ezra 3 that they were weeping loudly. So much so that the people at a distance were hearing the cries and they were unable to decipher. Are those people, is there, is there joy and laughter? Or is there crying going on? Like they couldn't even understand what was happening. Because of the outcry, these people that were looking at this going, oh man, they're seeing, many people are going, whoa, thank you God, the temple. And there's all these older people going, oh, this is awful. There's nothing of this that resembles Solomon's temple. It's not even a temple, it's more of a shed. It's even fit for a shed. I mean, they're weeping over this. They're going, this, this isn't going to work. And they're crying over it all. Well, God, recognizing the weakness and the struggle many were having, says to them, Guys, what does he say multiple times in those verses that I just read? Somebody tell me what he said multiple times is that word of encouragement. To be what? Be strong. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people. Be strong. Why should they be strong? What was God saying that they can be strong about? Because I, God says, I'm with you. Because I'm with you. You're not having to deal with this yourself. This isn't about you and your strength, your mistaken power. This is about seeing what God can do. God is going to do a work here in this. I'm with you. That's the word that God wants to remind you of tonight. You might be facing something that you look at and go, how is this ever going to amount to anything? How is God ever going to do something through this? Look at that. I can't do anything with that. What? God says, hold on. Be strong. I'm with you. Wait and see what I'm going to do through this. Trust me in that. We have the reality of a living God who is with us, doing life with us, that accompanies us, that abides with us, that strengthens us in all these things that we're weak in, that we have no, no business doing any of these things, but it's only through the Lord. And the Lord wants to be our help. He wants us moving forward confidently and joyfully because He is with us. And notice this here in verse 7. Oh, as they're looking at this temple going, oh, this is awful. What is ever going to come of this? Notice what God says here in verse 7 of chapter 2. And I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai, now you might have missed this here, but Haggai records a remarkable prophecy for us here in verse 7. Because what he's saying here is that the desire of all nations, speaking of Jesus 
is going to come into this temple. This very temple that you're building out of a, a heap of rubble, this very temple that you're looking at going, there's no way this is going to amount to Solomon's temple. This very temple that you're looking to build up here from this junk pile is going to be filled with glory because Jesus, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer for the whole world is going to set foot in this temple. He's going to come to this temple and he's going to be the desire of all nations. Greater glory is this temple going to see? Amazing. Think about that. How cool is that? The temple may not look glorious, but it's going to be filled with great glory in a future day because of Jesus Christ. So Haggai's third message now, verse 10 of chapter 2. Talk about murky purity. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priests concerning the law, Saying, if anyone carries holy meat in the fold of, the, of his garment, uh, I wouldn't advise, you know, doing that. But if anybody's going to carry holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will that become holy? Then the priest answered and said, no. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is his people, and so is his nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now that might sound like a bit of a riddle to you here, but what Haggai is, is dealing with, he's asking a couple questions about their purity and holiness. The bottom line and point that Haggai is making here is that you cannot pass on holiness to someone or something else, but you can pass on defilement it's the same with our health today right if somebody's sick you don't go out to them and say i'm healthy let me pass on my health to you no you say get away from me because your sickness is going to transfer to me so stay away we don't transfer our health but sickness gets transferred in the same way our holiness doesn't just get transferred over to other things but oftentimes those things that are defiled or sinful are going to infect us See, the people were working, they're worshiping, but they were still dealing with sin. And sin was defiling their work and their worship. Though they had taken action to rebuild the temple, thinking that, oh, well, this will cover all of our past failures and sin. This will just cover, we're doing a work for the Lord. No, that work was actually becoming defiled because of their sin. That sin that had dominated their life for years was still playing out and it was affecting them. See, God's not interested in your work. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in you in, in serving him uh, out of a heart to please him and honor him. Not just thinking that, well, I'll just do this work for the Lord and that's going to make up for everything I've done. No, God's concerned about your heart. Sometimes we overlook our own attitudes and sin because we think we're being faithful in our work to the Lord. Yet the work just becomes defiled. Serve the Lord with a pure heart and out of a good attitude because blessing will flow out of that. So Haggai gives that fourth message on murky purity. Now the last message he gives, man of prophecy. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. It says, and again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I've chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. So the signet ring was kind of a, a token of royal authority. Much like a throne or a crown or a scepter that someone had, it was a symbol of authority there. Well, Zerubbabel's ancestor, King Jehoiakim, as, as Warren Wiersbe says, also known as, as Konia, King Jehoiakim, had been rejected by God, but Zerubbabel now was accepted by God. Remember Jeremiah 22, verse 24, we talked about this here. It says, as I live, says the Lord, though Konia, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my ring hand, yet I would pluck you off. How was that? That, that blood line cursed there uh, of that 
King and David, where many people thought, how is this going to play out now? How's, how is there going to be a, a descendant of David to take the throne now if they've been cut off? Well, God was reversing the judgment and renewing his promise that the Davidic line would not die out, but one day give the world a savior. That's why we find Zerubbabel named in the genealogies of Jesus Christ, both in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. And those genealogies come out from different ways through, through Mary on one side and then through Joseph on the other side, bypassing that, that curse in a sense and coming to Jesus Christ. But Zerubbabel, we see here, is a chosen man of God. That message must have encouraged Zerubbabel greatly here just to stay on the job, to finish and complete the work that God had given him to do. He was special to God. God has chosen him. He's the servant of God. He was near and dear to the heart of God here, just as a, a king's signet ring would be. So the people of Israel would have many centuries of struggle and suffering before them, but one day the Messiah would come through that line. And one day Israel's enemies would be defeated as the Lord is spelling out here at the end of chapter 2. And that glorious kingdom would again be established. So that's the book of Haggai. Now, just to summarize here, some practical lessons that we see here. In, in Zephaniah, we, we see in that book here how we need to look within, look around, and look beyond. Look within. Are, are you worshiping God in spirit and truth? That's what they were called out over. As the day the Lord was being emphasized there to the Jews. They look within because their worship had gotten away from the Lord. Are you worshiping God in spirit and truth with your whole heart? And then we need to look around because God takes care of those things that seem to be in opposition to you. Remain trusting the Lord and live in his grace and love just as those nations around Israel God was going to deal with. And then we need to look beyond. Regardless how things might look today, God has set up a glorious future for us. And it's all because of Jesus. Be glad for all that he's done for you today. Practical lessons in Haggai. Haggai teaches us to not get burned down by our circumstances. Don't let circumstances allow you to neglect your relationship with God. Seek him and his will first. Just as Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then we see that obedience to God leads to productivity for God. So we've been called to do that. That's what we're seeing on Sundays in John 15, being fruitful, right? God, God desires us to follow his commandments. Not out of obedience, but out of love, out of his love for us and our love for him. And then lastly, rely on God's strength, not your own. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Josiah. Be strong, people. Be strong, Riverside, because the Lord is with you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time here tonight and these two prophets that we look at. Um, God, though they're speaking in such a, a time period that we have trouble sometimes relating to, Lord, we know that, that you are eternal and your truths are eternal. And there's great application for us in many of the things that even the people in this day were going through and how we can relate to things that we might even face today. Lessons to be learned, truths to apply, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to do just that and to live out your word. And we thank you, God, that you are indeed with us. No matter how great the, the problem or the opposition or the obstacles might look in front of us, God, you're with us. May we never forget that. And you are faithful to see us through. So may we continue to hold on to you, to abide in you, to trust you in all these things, Lord. And may we just bring glory and praise to you in all that we do. So we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.